Welcome back to EMC World. This is SiliconANGLE and Wikibon's The Cube, our flagship program. We go out to the advanced extractive city from those. It's our prime time segment. At the middle of the day, we take a break and cover what's going on in the news. I'm John Furrier with my co-host here, Dave Vellante of Wikibon.org, and this is SiliconANGLE.com. Go there for the reference point for tech innovation. Go to Wikibon.org for free research. Um, Dave, uh, what's your take on the big data news here, uh, here, at e yeah, here at EMC World? What's your take? Well, John, so, um, you know, there's a real tie-in between the whole software-defined piece and the big data. We heard uh, Paul Moritz today laying down the sort of pivotal initiative, the, the vision, <clears throat> to really become the, the platform for big, fast data applications. So, you know, EMC's communicating that to its customers. I think, I think a lot of people in, in this core community are like, hmm, that's interesting, very visionary, I think it's hard for some people to get their hands around, but I think it's also very clear that EMC intends to put its stake in the ground. John, we've talked about, will there be a red hat of a dupe? <laughs> EMC doesn't want somebody else to run away with that. Yeah, and obviously big data is a theme in storage. The two things I'm noticing out on the Joe Tucci keynote was one, security and big data. So obviously they're going to bring analytics and big data to the security paradigm. And a, lot, a lot of news lately about two-factor authentication, Twitter being hacked, a lot of hacking going on, so that's a big issue. And the other thing is that we heard from uh, John Rose, the CTO at the, uh, EMC, is that's decoupling and making things highly cohesive and abstracting away the complexity. This is the words of operating system. This is a platform. EMC is building a platform. And that platform is storage. And you're going to have a scale out fabric that's going to be storing stuff in hopefully perpetuity. But that's clearly where EMC is going, Dave. They are going open. They're saying we are the new multi vendor, which is open and choice. And that's really the, kind of the key thing. I mean, I, the, other than that, I think the show is just right on message operating system, big data, cloud, mobile, social. Well, let me make a comment about that. So, I tell you right now. Um, Joe Tochi many times talked about open. He said, you're probably sick of me here, you know, here, sick of me saying this, but we're open, we're going to give you choice. And he did say once or twice, there will be no lock-in. Now, I'll make an observation. To make money in this business, there's got to be some type of quote unquote lock-in. There's got to be stickiness. And I think EMC's, you know, has that. It has that, you know, in spades today with its, with its you know, controller-based architectures, and I think software-defined storage and Viper has a degree of lock-in. I think S3, you know, Amazon's web services, has a ton of lock-in. IBM obviously has its lock-in. It's the degree of choice, I think, that EMC's trying to differentiate amongst the competition. Okay, we got Winston here. Edmonds, our correspondent out in the field here. Studio B, our check-ins. What are you What are you seeing here? Well, you know, uh, I had a chance to speak with Bill Smarzo about what he does, and you know, he's, he says that he has the best job in tech, and I tend to believe him. He he gets to spend time and uh, what he called going with the, the journey of uh, helping customers explore how and when to to uh, to roll out a big data uh, plan. So it was really fascinating the way he kind of. Uh, discovers the needs and the insights that, that can be extrapolated. Well, you're, you're new to the CUBE team, so I'll just share with you that, that Bill Schmarz was the dean of big data. We coined that a couple years ago. He is so enthusiastic, but he's passionate about solving business problems. And he told me on the CUBE, when we did a check-in here, he said, hey, I'm excited to talk about move from speeds and feeds to solving business problems with, with business leaders, not about the technology. So um, we have a check-in with Bill Schmarzo. Take a look at this clip right now and on SiliconANGLE. We'll be right back, but watch this clip and check in uh, with Bill Schmarzo. Here with Bill Schmarzo, Studio B. Wanted to ask a few questions. Walk us through a day in the life of Bill Schmarzo. What is it like for you to do your job? So, I like to tell people I have the best job at EMC. Which I get to spend all of my time talking to customers, right? Working with them and figuring out where and how to start their big data journey. So it's a, my average day is if I'm not actually traveling someplace, in exotic locations like Des Moines, Iowa, and, and Omaha, Nebraska, and Chicago, and places like that. So if I'm not actually traveling and working with customers, I'm actually on the phone many times, actually reviewing stuff, reviewing processes, trying to help them figure out where are the right business cases to go after. I like you called it a journey, a, a big data journey, and you know you, you've talked about uh, looking for business-led, uh, business opportunity-led IT uh, deployments. Tell us a little bit more about that. So the, the the challenge that we've seen for the last, I would say, the last 18 months is that for a lot of organizations, big data has been nothing about but except technology. It's almost been a science experiment. 
And what's happened over the last four or five months is the business has gotten clued on to the fact that I have this wealth of data, both structured and unstructured formats, I have the ability to ingest this data in real time, and I have some massive analytic capabilities available, I can start teasing insights out of that data. Insights about my customers, my products, my operations, that really can help me drive better decisions and even create all new monetization opportunities. What has uh, been some of the aha moments that your customers have, you know, when they, when they finally grasp that and are, you know, really look forward to the journey themselves? So I think the area that surprises them most is that they're very heavily focused on trying to figure out how do I optimize my existing business processes, which by the way is a great place to start for a lot of organizations, but the aha comes when they start mining all that insights that come out of that process and realizing, oh my gosh, I have all these great insights that I can monetize in new ways through new products, new services, a new user experiences, even packaging insights and sell it to others. So that aha moment comes sort of after they started doing this optimization process and realizing that the byproduct is all this insight that's really valued by other parties. Uh, how can you kind of try to fast forward to that point? How can you, as you're educating people and, and businesses, how can you get them to really uh, get to that moment uh, sooner than, than they are in some cases? Well, it, it takes a, a corporate mindset on their part that really is about joining together and collab driving collaboration between the business side and the IT side. The groups that I've seen successful are the ones that bring both parties to bear and then we run a series of envision exercises with them to help sort of to imagine the realm of what's possible. Because they haven't really thought through, you know, I have all this unstructured data, consumer comments and, and notes from call centers and email dialogues, and in those unstructured data sources are invaluable nuggets that can help them learn more about their customers' interests, passions, affiliations, and associations that can impact the way they interact with customers. So the way that we do it is we can really drive collaboration between the business and IT. It's to run these envisioning exercises to really help people to sort of to envision the realm of what's possible. Are there any unique kind of case studies or just uh, big ideas around these business opportunities that, uh, that where it makes sense uh, for, for big data that you maybe hasn't been implemented but has just been you know, a really big idea in that, in that realm. Well, I would say we're seeing um, case studies kind of popping up in two different areas. Number one, companies that are dealing with consumers, so retailers, banks, telco companies, they're the ones who can get a lot of value out of, out of their subscriber and customer behavioral analytics, right? Understanding what kind of things their customers do, what kind of products take a light, how do they behave in certain situations. So that's a huge wealth of information, not only from a customer engagement perspective, but also from a developing and marketing products perspective. On the B2B side, the business to business side, we're seeing a lot of interest in predictive maintenance. So doing a project with an organization, they, they, they have wind turbines across the, the great state of Iowa, and they're trying to figure out how do I optimize performance of those turbines, and how do I do better predictive analytics? So again, business to business organizations are trying to figure out, I have all this censored telemetry data, how do I mine that to really help improve my maintenance predictability and drive better performance of all my operations? Fantastic. Mr. Smarzo, thanks for stopping by Studio B. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, guys. Okay, we're back here uh, inside theCUBE. Uh, you saw Bill, Bill Smarzo talking about big data. Dave, obviously we've got Pat Gelsinger coming up next on theCUBE, so stay with us here in this prime time. Obviously the news uh, all over the web is uh, about EMC World. In fact, we just got some exclusive footage uh, or post from, uh, or response from NetApp, Dave, on, on uh, their, uh, their response to uh, EMC. Um, that was interesting. We're going to post that on Silicon Angle. Always good to get the competitive response, and quite frankly, we love the point counterpoint on theCUBE, and I'm interested to see how that responds responds well, what NetApp's yeah. saying. What's your take on uh, NetApp's response? Well, so Brendan Howe you know, made a statement basically saying, hey, EMC, welcome to the party. Uh, that, that, you know, ONTAP, you know, there's a capability within ONTAP that is essentially software-defined storage. Now, um, it's a little bit fuzzy. I don't think NetApp, you know, packaged it nearly as crisply as, as EMC has and made a big splash about it. But I will say this about, about NetApp. I mean, NetApp, you see, go to the, the, the airports, you see the ONTAP, number one operating system, and it is. I mean, that's the, 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 the greatest strength of NetApp is you know, the waffle architecture and its ability to have sort of a, a single architecture, single operating system that can do many things for many people. Having said that, that's one of the biggest challenges that NetApp has, is how do you make that scale? Um, and so, you know, a clustered ONTAP is the answer you know, to that. So, I think NetApp's always had a set of rich data services, but they still are, largely embedded with the controller. And I think that's the difference between traditional storage, whether it's EMC, IBM, HP, Hitachi, et cetera, 
and this notion, John, of software-defined storage, where you're separating the function from the back-end storage. I think NetApp actually has an opportunity that more people don't see, and then my take on NetApp is, is that I think that they've, they always survive trans, uh, transformations in markets, and they've done that, this, this classic Silicon Valley trait. And I think what was interesting about that NetApp is their OpenStack presence was very interesting to me, Dave. I think that as we talk about operating systems, the ONTAP and NetApp elements could fit well into this build your own, make it part of an ingredient element of an operating system. I don't want to say they're a feature of the operating system, but in a way, they are a feature of the operating system. They have that opportunity. So if they play their cards right, by integrating in and automating and having that automating capability, if they can get that done, you're going to see this element multi-vendor. So <coughs> NetApp's not going to be bounced out of accounts. I think they, they might actually grow with EMC. Well, let me, let me break it down. So first of all, NetApp is the largest independent storage provider uh, left, with, I, with the obvious exception of EMC, but I don't even consider EMC a storage company anymore. I mean, it's so diverse. So NetApp is sort of sitting on this, this island, and it's got a big install base, and it you know, obviously popularized filers. Now what happened, John, was it, you know, essentially they sold a lot of them. And when you sell a lot of these you know, NAS boxes, they're hard to manage. So NetApp is, is trying to bet the company on something called clustered ONTAP. They're trying to make scale out clustering work, and they've been working at, at it for probably you know, past five, six, seven years. So they, as I say, are betting the company on this. It is the key for their <clears throat> survival in my uh, estimation. I've talked to a number of people, David Floyer, you know, guys like Roger Cox over at Gartner. You know, they think it's the real deal, uh, but NetApp's obviously got to execute on it. Well, we got Pat Gelsinger coming on, Dave, and that's going to be very interesting to see Pat. Uh, we got to gear up and get our mental energy ready because last time we, we went uh, the distance and he, we, had, we ran out of questions. So uh, hopefully he'll be in a good mood. Yeah, that but, has happened. He's really like the only guy, John, I've ever seen you run out of questions on. And it was like it was only after about 55 minutes, but. <laughs> he caught me on a bad day. Not today, though. I got a <laughs> freaking binder full of notes. <laughs> Pat Gelsinger, we're going to exhaust his brain. We're going to extract all the signal out of Pat Gelsinger today. Uh, Winston, let's get kick it over to Winston, our new correspondent uh, out of Dallas, also anchor as well. But you'll see him, you'll see him uh, throughout the mix now as part of SiliconANGLE Studio B. Uh, Winston, you also are going to be doing this check-in program where we're going to start checking in with folks. And we already got some folks we're going to check in later today. Just walk by, drive by the Cube, friends of ours, and, and explain uh, what check-ins are. Well, you know, it's the, there's a social element to these conferences. And, not everyone, we don't have time to have everyone on the show, so I want to get out and really just kind of get into the middle and get into the, uh, the weeds of what's happening here. What are people seeing? What are they experiencing? What are they feeling? Because you, know, you, can, you can quote your, uh, you know, your scripted lines, but when we show up and we just have a chat with you, I think it's a little more real and we'll, we'll get some genuine responses. You know, that's exactly it. The check-in really is a social element. You know, Foursquare pioneered the check-in. You know, you check into a place, become the mayor of a place. Facebook has check-ins. Everyone's got check-ins. But the idea of a check-in, Dave, is to check in with people because, you know, we want to know what they're, what they're, what's going on. We asked Jonathan Rose, what's your, how's your new job? We're checking in. We care about what's going on with the individuals. And uh, that's what it's all about. This is theCUBE, SiliconANGLE's flagship program. We'll be uh, right back with our next guest, Pat Gelsinger. Um, we'll see how long Pat can hang with us. We'll try to get as much time as we can. <laughs> if you have any questions, go to at Furry or at DeVellante. We'll try to get Pat Gelsinger those pointed questions. But we'll be right back with Pat Gelsinger, the CEO of VMware, CUBE alum and good friend of ours. We'll be right back with Pat Gelsinger. <laughs>